As you recall, when David went out to uh, fight Goliath, he was advised to put on Saul's armor. You know, David, again, is just the teenage boy, the shepherd visiting his brothers down there. And of course, he hears the, the rants and the challenge of, of Goliath. Nine feet tall, based on proportion, would have weighed at least 400 pounds. He'd been a warrior since his youth. He's decked out in his regalia and all of his armor. And, uh, and so the offer is made for David to put on Saul's armor. Well, Saul, we know from Scripture, is a head taller than everybody else. So you can imagine David trying to put on Saul's armor and having it be several sizes too large. Uh, David's response is uh, interesting in 1 first, uh, first Samuel 17. <laughs> he says, uh, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied, defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. That's a lot of faith. <laughs> but he, again, David wasn't attributing anything to his own abilities. Uh, he was... It was all what, what the Lord was going to do. He had confronted God. I'm just going to go out and represent God, and God will take care of him. In fact, I've seen it over and over again in my life, David says. And uh, apparently, I, I don't think this is hyperbole. I think he really killed lions and killed, uh, and killed bears in order to protect the sheep uh, that were entrusted uh, to him. And as far as he was concerned that uh, God's strength had enabled him in that way. So now in a greater capacity, uh, God's strength, uh, strength would, enable, uh, would enable him as, uh, as well. But again, when we talk about the putting on the armor of God, Paul makes the point very quickly that, that everything is related to a relationship with Jesus Christ and everything we do in terms of taking a stand against the enemy, and he uses that phrase several times, we saw last week, is done in the strength of the Lord, not in our own strength. We are, we are no match for Satan and his cohorts, but he is no match for God. So we go out in, uh, in God's, uh, God's strength. We also talked last week about the idea that that Satan is the god of, of the planet or the god of this, this age, Paul, Paul says. We'll see later when we look in, in uh, Matthew 4 that he offers the kingdoms of this world to Jesus if he would just bow his knee and worship him. And Jesus doesn't say, well, they're not, they're not yours to give. Uh, and we see all around us, and, and maybe that's a question you get sometimes. I was sharing with somebody just uh, about a week ago and they were asking about the evil in the world. And I said, yes, there is evil in the world. And that shows us that Satan is, is basically running the show here. But one day God will come back and establish his kingdom. This is not the way God meant it to be. This is a fallen world that we live in. And we see the, the evil all of, all of the time. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if you're like me. It seems like it's getting worse uh, all, the, all the time as well. I wanted to read a quote from... Uh, Chuck Colson's book uh, entitled, uh, Who Speaks for God? And um, he begins by quoting uh, Charles Krauthammer. And Krauthammer uses a phrase that he picks up on. Krauthammer says, uh, the inability to make moral distinction is the AIDS of the intellectuals, an acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Moral blindness of this caliber requires practice. Uh, it has to be learned. And, and there is a complete breakdown, uh, obviously, in terms of morality with our own country and our culture. And, uh, and it is the influence of, of Satan o over this world and over the hearts and minds of people. Colson goes on and says this in regards to that remark. In a culture infected with moral aids, words lose all meaning or they are manipulated to obscure meaning. Thus, taxes become revenue assessment enhancements. 
Perversion is gay. Murder of the unborn children is freedom of choice. Marxism in the church is called liberation theology. These are all good words. In the Nazi era, the final solution had a nice ring to it also. And everyone just nods unquestioningly. But when words lose their meaning, it is nearly impossible for the word of God to be received. If sin and repentance means nothing, then God's grace is irrelevant. Our preaching falls on deaf ears. This moral deafness leads to disaster. The scripture tells us that it was when people accept, accepted King Ahab's gross evils as trivial that fearsome judgment befell uh, ancient Israel. And we, we see this moral decline. And we see, in a sense, Satan having his way with the hearts and the minds of, of our culture. And, uh, and certainly it, it is troubling. And in the same way, uh, he desires that for us, for words to lose their meaning. Uh, to be able to attack our thought life and change the priorities of our lives. And sometimes we can come under attack from Satan, and it is so subtle uh, it is that uh, we don't even detect what's going on. Certainly it would be a, a, a lot easier uh, if it was like the Hollywood movies where, uh, where the, the person is, uh, you know, uh, head spinning around backwards and, you know, speaking in three different voices and all that. It's like, okay, I think that's Satan right there, you know. It, but it's, it's not like in the Hollywood movies. Satan attacks us as believers in a much more subtle way, uh, and we need to be very careful. Jesus tells Paul that, that people under the power of Satan, in Acts 26, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Satan has a power, and, uh, and we were all under its influence at one point in time, but we've been turned from that power to the power of God, which is a, a greater power. When we are born again of God's Spirit, though, the battle doesn't end. In many ways, the battle just begins. And so Paul, again, here addressing this issue of how do we engage the enemy, how do we, how do we enter the battle? As that great prophet of old, Bob Dylan, once said, when a man is born again, the sparks begin to fly. And, uh, and what we're trying to do over the next couple of weeks, last week, and then uh, continuing on is just to make us more aware of the attacks of the enemy. Again, we're not going to an extreme that every time a, a gate creaks, we think it's, there's a demon in it. Uh, but we don't want to be the other extreme of, of in a sense, not even believing that Satan is out there, that he has, as we saw last week, a specific scheme against us, and that he is patient, and he will watch, and he will wait, and the day of evil comes, we need to make sure that we're trusting in the Lord, put on the full armor of God so that we can, uh, we can take our stand. Uh, again, last week, we uh, pointed out that the struggle is not a physical one. We saw that in verse 12, in verse 13 and 14. Paul told us to put on the belt of truth. And again, the, the belt of truth, we said, is what gets it all together. For the Roman soldier, it's how he could basically, the King James phrase is, gird up his loins or pull up that toga, put it in the belt so now he can move and has mobility. He's able to engage the, uh, the enemy and so forth. Truthfulness speaks of sincerity uh, and there's no room for hypocrisy. If there is, it will be an area where the enemy attacks us. If we don't have full confidence in the truth of God's word, it will be an area in which the enemy can attack us and will really leave us defenseless uh, in many other ways, as we'll see uh, this morning. The breastplate of righteousness, we said, was, again, that practical righteousness where in our own life, when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, things that we should not be doing, not be thinking. And we take that to the Lord. We ask for forgiveness. And when we do that, we're cinching up. Uh, again, in that, that righteousness that Christ has given us, we're, we're eliminating places where the enemy can come in and attack us uh, in, those, uh, in those areas. If I'm compromising, if I'm in sin in an area, Satan will come in with the machaira, that dagger-type sword is the illustration, and penetrate even in that small area and establish a beachhead uh, and eventually uh, bring us down, in a sense, in terms of our walk with Jesus Christ. As we continue this morning, we're going to begin with the shoes that are the gospel of, of peace. Let's take a look at, at, uh, at verse 15 or verse 14 again says, Stand firm then 
with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we'll continue on from there next week, the very important subject of, of prayer. But again, first thing is the shoes are the gospel of peace, and the gospel of peace he likens, or the metaphor is that, to a Roman soldier, which was very important. We often uh, don't think about um, footwear. To some of us, it's uh, a matter of fashion. To others of us, it's a, a very practical uh, issue. But the Roman soldier, it was, uh, it was very critical. Like Alexander the Great, the, the great Roman generals learned from him something called the, the Long March. Uh, they would have their enemy in their sights. They would know where they were located. They were uh, in pursuit of them. The enemy would be aware that the Romans are coming. And what the Romans would do is that they would march all day and then all night and then all day and then all night and then all day and then all night. And then they're there two and a half days sooner than they could possibly get there. They catch the enemy totally by surprise and are able to, uh, to destroy them. They're only able to do that if they, they have their, you know, the, the, the footwear specifically designed to do that kind of day and, and, and night uh, marching. And, um, and so Paul likes that and says, this is a critical area. If we're going to stand against the enemy, then in a sense, our footwear needs to be understood as the gospel of peace. And that is the gospel, that man can have peace with, with God. Uh, the, the attack, the way that Satan attacks in this area, basically is to get you to doubt your, your salvation. Uh, and so the gospel of peace must be understood and, uh, and accepted, that we're saved by God's grace and God's grace alone. And I won't belabor this a lot because we, we teach on it, we try to emphasize it, but you can understand that uh, for the person that, that uh, is not sure if they're saved, uh, it's, it's like going into battle barefooted. And it's like going into an NFL game with all of your, your pads on, but you're barefooted. Uh, you're going to have a, a very difficult time. If you're not sure if you're saved and your faith, are you going to share it with someone else? Probably not. Uh, and so this is an issue where the enemy hammers and attacks all the time. If you listen to a, a Christian call-in show like Pastor, does, Pastor Chuck does on, on um, Pastor's Perspective in the Afternoon, on K Light, if you listen for a week or so, you won't have to listen to too many days before this question comes up. Somebody's doubting their salvation. After all, I did this, I said this, and you know, have I committed the unpardonable sin? And you get these things. It's a very common question because there is teaching within the body of Christ that you can uh, lose lose your salvation. That it's predicated upon your behavior and your ability to not not sin. Uh, and if that's really what the Bible taught, I would suggest we. We're all in a lot of trouble. But the Bible teaches the opposite of that. Paul's just kind of expounded this in this letter in chapter 2, that we are saved by grace uh, and grace alone. It's not of ourselves. It's not good works. It's, it's uh, simply by God's unearned, unmerited favor that he's given us. We place our faith in his grace, and he saves us in Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus 3.5, kind of a classic verse. He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. That's, that's pretty clear. I like uh, 2 Timothy uh, um, uh, 1.8, where uh, Paul says, But join with me in, in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. And then here's the reason. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. When did God give us the grace? Did we do something to earn it? No, it was according to his own purpose, his own grace, before you were ever born, before the beginning of time. God had already decided to give you his grace. Is that pretty clear that you didn't do anything uh, to, to earn it uh, in any way? Romans eleven five. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Uh, so the, the gospel of peace, and that is our shoes that allows us to march with the gospel and defend ourselves against the enemy, is that we're saved by grace and grace alone. Uh, and if, uh, 
uh, we have issues with with this very basic uh, basic uh, doctrine, then uh, the enemy is going to come in and, and attack us in that area. Again, if the enemy can get us to doubt our own salvation, we'll feel condemned. Uh, we won't share our faith. And the other thing that's very interesting is, is often when we're under attack in this area and we feel very condemned, we have a tendency to stay away from other believers. I'm not doing well. When we're not doing well with the Lord, we have a tendency to, to stay away. What, what's, it's the very thing we need when we're not doing well with the Lord. We need to be around other believers. We need to uh, have other people praying for us. We need to be hearing God's word. But you can understand the tactic. If he can come in and discourage and get you to doubt your own salvation because of your sin, because of something you've done, thought, whatever might be going on, if he can divide you off away from the body of Christ, then he's going to be able to, uh, to really uh, wreak some havoc in, in your life. So the shoes are the gospel of peace. The shield, the Roman shield represents our faith. It was about four feet by two and a half feet. It was made out of wood. It was sometimes uh, braced up with metal and always covered with uh, leather on, on the outside. I don't know if you've seen seen the idea of a Roman phalanx in, uh, in action. It's, it's portrayed uh, uh, in a couple of movies, one particular uh, that's very good, but there was uh, way too much blood and gore to, to show it as an illustration on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning, but uh, because it's in the midst of a battle. But again, the phalanx, they would, the guys in the front would have these shields and they could, in a sense, lock those shields together. I mean, they would go anywhere from 200 yards to five miles in length. In a sense, they carried the fort with them. And of course, they needed that. They needed the protection because, as Paul says here appropriately, and maybe you've seen in some of those movies where uh, there would be volleys of, of arrows, of flaming arrows that would come. They would be di- dipped in, in pitch, lit, and then shot. So it's not a matter of just avoiding the arrow because the arrow doesn't have to hit you. It could hit a part of your body armor, but then the oil would splatter. And if it caught your clothing, you're on fire. You're, you're in big trouble. So the way they were protected from these flaming arrows is the phalanx. Uh, the, the arrows would come, a command would be given, the shields were locked, they were put over them, and they, and they, they were protected. Uh, the arrows would hit the leather, would not ignite on fire, it would just run off. After those volleys are over, then another command is given, boom, they're up and they're, they're marching uh, once again. The Roman military was, was very brutal, but it was very impressive in terms of their discipline and uh, and what they were able to uh, accomplish. Paul looks at that and says, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. The enemy shoots arrows at us. They don't even have to hit us directly. Uh, they are so poisonous that uh, just having them around us or near us again, and how do they attack us? Through our mind, uh, it can be very discouraging at time. And the way we protect ourselves as believers is, uh, uh, is with the shield of faith. Let's talk about the arrows in a sense because the shield's purpose is protection. Now, 1 John 5, 3 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world, the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Uh, it's, it's our faith in, in, in Jesus Christ. It's our faith in the word of God that's going to protect us when the arrows come. There's an arrow of sensuality, seeks to light a flame within us. There's an arrow of materialism that seeks to change the priorities of our, uh, of our lives so that we begin to rationalize our behavior. And uh, when these arrows are being shot at us, it's not the philosophies of this world that are going to help you if you hold them up. Uh, they will not uh, keep any of these arrows back. There's arrows of criticism and rejection that even come from within Christians, within the church. <laughs> we can be very, very... Uh, very criticized at times, or uh, things that happen, things that, that, I mean, it's terrible, but Satan can use our words sometimes, as we've been studying in Proverbs, to actually, again, shoot an arrow from him to uh, discourage or hurt somebody else. Those are some of the, the toughest ones. And again, the uh, the uh, the tendency then is I can be driven out of fellowship and out of the body of Christ, which is what Satan wants. But we need to lift up that shield of faith and trust what God says about us and our relationship with him uh, and, uh, and what he wants to do in and through our lives. And primarily, uh, when, these, when these arrows are shot, it's an attempt to get us to, to mistrust God, to, to mistrust God. And... Um, 
And sometimes the, the shield that we need to lift up might be Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his, his purpose. Always comes back to the word of God. Always comes back to a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. Even the garden, remember the initial temptation, which in a sense becomes a, a model temptation for us. Satan comes and says, did God really say? Do you really believe the Bible? Is it really true? Is it really trustworthy? After all, how could God say this? Because after all, Eve, he's just trying to deny you something. Why would he say not eat of this fruit? He knows that if you eat from this fruit, you'll be like him yourself. He's really not a loving heavenly father because if he were, he would never deny you this. So it's always, do you lift up the shield of faith? Say, no, I trust God. I don't understand what's going on in my life right now. I don't like the circumstances I am, but I know God's character and I'm going to trust him. His name is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And I'm going to believe God despite the circumstances. I, um, I, I want to use uh, Gideon as a kind of an illustration of this as well, just because it's, uh, it's almost comical. The, uh, the initial, you know, when the angel of the Lord goes to Gideon, calls him a mighty warrior and stuff, because he's, he's not. He's, you know, they're under attack from the Midians. And what the Midian, Midianites would do, they would allow the Israelites to, to, uh, to plant their crops, to raise their crops, to harvest their crops. And just when they harvested their crops, that's when they would raid them and take all their food and everything. Just a little frustrating. Uh, and, um, and they, you know, Gideon kind of understands that, I mean, you know, what's going on? You know, if God was really <clears throat> with this, why would he allow uh, this to happen? And in the midst of this, Gideon is, um, he's in a wine press uh, threshing his, uh, his wheat, which he usually do it on a hilltop. But he's kind of trying to hide out so the Midianites don't realize what he's doing. And it's, it's in that point of incredible fear uh, and incredible weakness uh, that the angel of the Lord comes to him in, in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. There it says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord be with you, mighty warrior. And I'm sure Gideon was like, <laughs> I think I'm the only one in, in here. Uh, but Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Uh, where were all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in strength, uh, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Uh, but Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Uh, so uh, he's got this, in a sense, this command of God to go out and, uh, and be a mighty warrior, but he really, he really wasn't. And, uh, and I think often, you know, we, we see ourselves in that position. We're, we're somewhere along the, the line of uh, God's calling us to, uh, to a life, telling us what we could become, a mighty warrior. Uh, and yet we feel like we're so, <laughs> I'm so not there. <laughs> and, uh, and yet the Lord, he says, no, I see who you can become. I don't have that kind of faith. Yeah, you know, start with a mustard seed, you know, and let's, and let's work from there. And, uh, and I think as we do in terms of the shield of faith and how we deal with the onslaught of the arrows of the enemy that attack us in our thought life, it could be a, a number of, uh, of different things. Uh, how do we get to the point where, where we can lift up that shield and trust God and have it not affect us? And, and I think it's just, it's just by doing it. God is so gracious to, to prove himself to us over and over again. Remember Gideon, this wasn't enough, right? I mean, Gideon says, well, how do I know that was really the Lord? How do I know God will be faithful to his word? Okay, I'm going to put out this lambskin, and if in the morning I get up, it's soaking wet, and everything else is dry, then I'll really know that it's the Lord, then I'll really, and the Lord does it. And then what does he do then? Well, that was good, but uh, okay, uh, how about if I, I put it out this time, and, and uh, it's dry, and everything else is wet, then I'll really know, you know, and, he, and we call that putting out a fleece after Gideon, which is not a statement of faith. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, he's doing this because he doesn't have any faith, right? Uh, and God says, well, I'm not using you. You can't even take me at my word. No, God says, he accommodates, you know, and, and does the things that, uh, that Gideon asked for. 
Uh, and God is asking him to do a lot. He asks us to do a lot as, as times as well. But the shield of faith is believing God and believing him enough not to put him to the test uh, and just to take him uh, at, at his word. Kent Hughes, one of my uh, favorite commentators, comment, commentary writers, says, faith binds us in vital, deep union with God. Faith is not just belief, it's belief plus trust. It is resting in the person of God uh, in his word to us. Paul says, bring the thoughts into the captivity, the, the attack of those arrows, and it can be a variety of things. And sometimes we just, we daydream or whatever, but uh, I, I hope you can develop the ability uh, to, to be able to tell when, man, you know, I'm here trying to worship the Lord and that stuff is coming in my mind while I'm trying to worship. It's from the enemy. It's not from God. It's, it's from the enemy. And, and we need to be able to, Lord, I just want to look to you and trust you and hold up that shield of faith and, and, uh, and, and uh, look to you and realize that when I'm worshiping, you know, I'm, I'm coming before your very throne. You know, you just be, have to be able to engage and, uh, and realize what's happening, that you're, you're under attack. Uh, the shoes are the gospel of peace. The shield is critical and uh, it's, uh, it's our faith. Again, it's belief plus trust in God, as, uh, as Ken Hughes had said there. And I also like the idea that uh, it was effective for the Romans because they locked them together. Uh, it was a, a corporate thing that really protected them. And I think that speaks of the, the relationships that we need to have with, with one another and standing against the enemy. The third thing is the helmet of salvation. Again, likened to a Roman soldier's helmet made out of hard leather or, or often metal. And certainly nobody would go into a battle without, without their, their helmet on. Uh, and that's because of what we called last week the broadsword, the double-edged blade held by two hands. That guy would just kind of go through a crowd swinging. Uh, and if he hits you, uh, it's, uh, it's all over. Your only protection against that would, uh, would be the, the helmet. And Paul looks at that and sees how critical that, that again, the, the mind is protected uh, and, uh, and likens it in terms of to the salvation experience. Now, there's three aspects of salvation. There's certainly uh, the idea that the helmet of salvation impacted our past. Uh, all of our sins have been forgiven. You came to faith in Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing to know that when you ask to be forgiven, every sin that you had ever committed uh, was forgiven uh, at, at that point. That's why Paul can say in Romans 8, 1, there therefore is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Very important uh, aspect of, uh, of salvation. We're new creatures in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Some people don't really believe that either. And, then, and we can get attacked by that. Well, not every sin, not all your sins. You know, you think God could, but remember that. In fact, he might forgive you, but doesn't mean he's not judging you right now, is it? And we, we, we get these thoughts, and they're, uh, they're from the enemy. The helmet of salvation should impact the, our past. The helmet of salvation is needed in, in the present, what we call referred to as sanctification, that process where the Holy Spirit is working in us. Again, Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. There, there, it's a transformation. King James says we're moving from glory to glory, sanctification, God's spirit working in us. So the helmet of salvation impacts our present, what's going on in our lives right now. The emphasis for Paul here, though I think is clearly on what we might refer to as salvation in terms of future, what we call glorification, and that's based on another time he uses this phrase in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. There he says, but since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation uh, is a helmet. So the helmet of salvation, I think Paul's emphasis, certainly as he kind of gives us another reference to it here, is really emphasizing the future and, and the hope and, uh, and understand how that would work. Uh, you're under attack from the enemy. You're being discouraged. You're struggling with your walk with the Lord. Circumstances of your life, temptations you've never faced before. Would it help to know that 
I'm going to be with the Lord one day. I don't know how this is all going to go down. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But either way, I'm in heaven forever one day. Would that make a difference in your day? Uh, th- I think that's exactly what Paul is trying to, uh, to uh, emphasize here. 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is, uh, is pure. Again, so when we're under the attack from the enemy, and it's an issue of uh, flaming arrows or whatever it might be in the thought life, it's important for us to remember, again, the, the future that we're going to have with the Lord. And I think that's why it's so, so important, to, again, to read the scriptures and read about the future, read what it's going to be like as we uh, sing and we worship, you know, the realization that, that uh, you know, it's, it's nothing now compared to what it's, uh, what's, what it's going to be like. We were singing a song uh, earlier uh, this morning that had, the, you know, the lyrics, you know, holy, holy in it. And the thought that came to my mind is that, wow, this is kind of awesome because we know from Scripture that that is sung around the throne of God. I mean, the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Wow, we're singing lyrics just like they're singing in heaven. I mean, I just, I just thought that was great. I mean, that we're going to be with the Lord. It's all going to happen. It's going to be a, a, a glorious thing. Ray Steadman, at, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with his ministries. He's uh, with the Lord now, but he's, he's discipled a couple of other guys that you might be familiar with, a guy named Chuck Swindoll and a guy named Louis Palau, but a tremendous uh, man of God. And I got to meet him a, a number of years ago. It's because it was either his son or daughter goes to a Calvary chapel. So I was at a conference. He saw my name tag and, hey, come over here. I want to meet you. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and, but uh, uh, just a, a tremendous man of God. He, a uh, uh, number of uh, great books. But he says in his commentary on Ephesians and, and this uh, helmet of salvation in particular, uh, he says, history is not uh, a meaningless jumble, but a controlled pattern. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself is directing these events. He is the Lord of history. Not only do we know that everything will work out right in the end, but we actually know that despite all appearances, the end of history is being worked out right now. One of the greatest reasons the church says so little to the world of true significance today is that we have neglected the helmet of salvation. We have neglected the hope of the coming of of the Lord that the Lord is coming back for, uh, for the church. And it could happen at, uh, uh, at any moment. And, uh, and certainly you could appreciate that that would be of critical importance if you're going through a major spiritual attack. I, um, I've gotten to you know, uh, meet and, and talk with a number of, uh, of men and women that have suffered uh, tremendous physical persecution in China as well as in, uh, in India. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, when, when they are going through those times, as they've said to me, uh, it's, it's all about living for eternity. It's all about living for heaven. We're in those gospel for Asia training schools, training these young guys, all of which will go out and be persecuted. It's a matter of if they will all be stoned, they will all be beaten at some point in time. Some of them will be martyred for their faith. And when, when you're in those times of worship and you sing songs about heaven, it's a war chant. It's, it's not just a, a, wor- a worship song. I mean, they, these guys, this is what it's all about. It's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about heaven. Nothing is about this life. And, and that's how they go through it. Paul says the, the severe attacks from the enemy, the helmet of salvation becomes uh, critical to us. And uh, uh, so very important. Paul says in Romans 8, 37, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who, who loved us. Somebody that uh, is, a, a, is a conqueror that, that goes into a battle and the battle turns and they're able to win. They become the conqueror. But Paul says we're more than that uh, because the victory has already been won in Jesus Christ. We know the end of the story. We know how it's all going to come out. Uh, it's uh, history itself is not just a, a you know a, a, you know this this craziness that seems to be all around us. There's actually a pattern, and uh, and God is the one that's in in control, and He is faithful to complete the work that He's begun. 
So the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the shoes that we need that are the gospel of peace, and then uh, the sword uh, of the Spirit uh, in uh, verse 17. The sword is a specific sword. Again, it's, uh, it's the Machaira, again, that long uh, dagger. It's, uh, it's uh, very specific. It's not just the broad sword, just swinging it all around. If it's going to be effective in battle, uh, that guy fighting with it is going to have to look for an opening in the armor, someplace specific to, to plunge it in if it's going to do uh, any good. So Paul says the, the sword uh, is, is like that sword, uh, and, and it's the word of God. Paul could have used a couple of different terms for a word. He could have used logos, which means God's word in its entirety. The sword of the Spirit is, is it's the whole Bible. And that, that would have been good. But that's not the word that he used. He uses the word in the Greek, rhema, which means a very specific word. The sword of the Spirit is a very specific word of God for a very specific situation. And uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon says it's a declaration of one's mind made into, uh, made into words. And uh, there's a lot of times I don't always have confidence in my words, but we can always have confidence in, uh, in God's word. Uh, now, this is demonstrated by Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter 4. I've got the verses for you, but if, you're, uh, if you want to turn to Matthew 4 to make any notes, or, or that, that might be a, a, a good thing to do as, as well. But here, we're familiar with it. Jesus is tested, uh, in a sense, in three, three, three times by Satan. Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan from John's ministry. He begins his ministry as the Holy Spirit drives him and leads him into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days uh, and 40 nights. Uh, at the end of that time, he begins to get hungry, which is an indication that he's about to starve to death. So he goes out there, in a sense, and makes himself as vulnerable as he possibly can so that he can, in a sense, draw Satan out to him to engage him in this warfare. Now, obviously, he doesn't need to do this, but he does it so that we can learn. And again, he didn't have Peter, James, and John running behind him, taking notes. Okay, he said this. Okay, then he did this. This is very good. This would be important. No, nobody's there, right? So that means Jesus has to tell them later in great detail exactly what happened, exactly what Satan said, and exactly what he said in order to react to it. Therefore, I think it's probably very important. So again, it's an example of using the sword of the Spirit. Now, I want to kind of parallel that in these three testings with a, a reference from um, 1 John 2, 15 and 16, because there John, writing uh, again in 1 John, gives us, in a sense, the tactics of the enemy, the way that he attacks us. Uh, if you were a linebacker in the NFL and you know the three plays that the offense had, you'd have a pretty good day. And so John is trying to lay out for us, how does the enemy attack us? It's in the mind, and it's an appeal to our flesh, our sin nature, or our self-centeredness. Uh, anytime that we're, uh, we can tell we're under attack is if there is a draw or a pull to get us to be concerned about me and nobody else, <laughs> as opposed to be concerned about others uh, in the kingdom of God. Uh, God's Spirit is going to teach us. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, Satan is always going to try to reverse that and get our eyes back upon ourselves in me and myself and, uh, and nobody else. First John 2.15, he says, do not love the world or anything in the world. It's a whole world system. He's not talking about uh, have a good day on, uh, on uh, Earth Day or something. Uh, he's talking about a world system, not, uh, not the plants and the flowers. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, this world system that is fallen, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. The man who does the will of God lives forever. So again, the cravings of sinful man or the lust of the flesh, as other translations would say, uh, we see this as in an attempt of Satan to use the world system and our flesh to get us focused on my personal needs. Again, and that is, we see, we'll see that in the first temptation. The boasting of what he has and what he does, is, or the pride of life, 
it again is an attempt to get us to focus on my purpose in life. And then the lust of the eyes, uh, we'll see that in this fallen world, and Satan will get us to try to focus on my promises for the future, my future, and what I, I want to see happen in my future. These are the ways that Satan comes and attacks Jesus uh, in Matthew 4. So if you're there, the first four, four verses read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Again, the tempter, the temptation is self-interest. You're out here, you're starving. And again, it's when he says, if you are the son of God, literally it's since you're the son of God, if and it is so. You're the son of God, that means you can do something about it. Do you think your father really cares about you? You've been out here 40 days and 40 nights with nothing. You're starving to death. If he cared about you, he would do something. He doesn't care about you. It's about time you start looking out for number one. If God really loved you, would he allow you to be in these circumstances? If God really loved you, would he allow this to happen to you over and over again? If God really loved you, he doesn't really love you. You'd better start thinking about yourself and get this out of your mind that somehow God is cares, he loves you, and he's going to provide for you because it's not going to happen. You have the ability. You have the power. Hey, you're the son of God. Do something about it is the temptation. Self-interest. Get your eyes back upon yourself. Is that a temptation? Is that, is that ringing with, with, with anybody? Uh, again, Satan says, watch out for number one. How does Jesus uh, deal with that? He takes out the sword of the spirit. He takes out a specific word of God for a very specific situation. He was starving to death, and, and the temptation is make, make something yourself to eat. Do something miraculous here on your own behalf. He says, and he quotes Deuteronomy, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I think that's a pretty good verse, given the circumstances, <laughs> uh, don't you? That's a very specific word of God, given the circumstances. And that's what Paul is trying to tell us to do. Find a verse that fits what I'm going through, what I'm dealing with, and then put it in my heart, put it in my mind. If I can't get it to stay there, write it on a card and put it in my pocket, but get it with you because that's how you're able to take a sword out and defeat Satan. That's the way Jesus did it. Let's look at the second temptation, the pride of life. Then the devil took him to a holy city, to the holy city, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to a test. Again, here the test that is suggested is that uh, the purpose of his life should be self-directed. You don't have to submit yourself to the will of the Father. Again, do you think the Father really cares for you that much? Listen, all you've got to do is pick a feast day. Two million people in the city. Go to the highest point of the temple. Hello, everybody down there. I'm the Messiah. Check this out. And then bungee jump off the... No, no bungee. Just jump. And then a couple of angels, because you know the Bible says they will lift you up and prevent you from dashing your foot against the stone. That would be pretty impressive, right? Jesus jumps off the highest point of the temple, being people watching. A couple of angels swoop down and lower him to the ground. Ooh, I think that's the Messiah. Why go to the cross? Why have all the suffering? Why go through all of this? Here's a way. <clears throat> you don't have to submit yourself to the will of the Father. It's too hard. It's too difficult. There's got to be a better way. The purpose for your life is not found in submission to the God of heaven. The purpose in life is you living your own life for your own fullness. You direct your life and the purposes of your life. That's the temptation. And how do we, and how do we deal with that? The same way Jesus did. Again, he 
takes out the sword of the Spirit. That's a pretty good one too. Jesus is pretty good, two for two here, When you say? A very specific word for the very specific situation that he finds himself in. I will not put the Lord God to the test. That's what you're asking me, uh, me to do. And, uh, and again, even in this one, Satan quotes scripture, though he misquotes Psalm 91 verse 11. And Jesus refuses to put his personal ambitions ahead of the will of the Father, quoting Deuteronomy 6.13 and Deuteronomy 8.3. The third temptation, the lust of the eyes. Again, the devil took him, we're in verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. So again, here's the test uh, to the Lord, suggesting that, he, uh, that the Father would not keep the promises in the future. Because in the future, the Messiah will rule and reign from Jerusalem. All the kingdoms will be his. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus knows this. And Satan says, do you really trust those promises, those promises in the future? You'll say the same thing to us. Do you really trust the promises of God? Can you really count on what's going to happen in the future? Again, after all, you wouldn't be in this mess. You wouldn't be in these circumstances if God really cared. It's always to mistrust the character of God. It's always to mistrust or not trust the promises of God. And if we don't, we have no sword. We have no shield. We have no shoes. We have no breastplate. Uh, We have no helmet of salvation because it's all predicated on what the Bible says to me in terms of my salvation and my relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. So the temptation is, hey, just don't believe the simple truth uh, of the word. So how do we use the sword of the spirit? Well, uh, in the same way, uh, again, uh, you're overcome with, with fear over the top. Again, it's not, we're talking abnormal when you shouldn't be. There's a sense of fear over you and you're, uh, you're sensing it as you're trying to sleep and you're waking hours or whatever. And you, you realize, and the idea is that as you, as you go through life as a Christian, you get a little more tuned in to realize, hopefully a little sooner than later, that, okay, this is the devil. <laughs> I'm under attack here. This is ridiculous. I don't have to be thinking this. I don't have to be believing this. I don't have to be feeling this. I don't have to be doing this. What am I doing? You know, start coming to uh, these, these thoughts in my mind, these, these fiery arrows. It's about time I lift up my shield and begin to trust God again. And what is a verse that will counteract what I'm feeling? How about the spear of the Lord is not one of fear, but it's one of love and power and self-discipline. And when I remind myself of that and I sense that, I go, that's not God, that's the devil. You're out of here and I'm going to worship God. I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to focus. That's how we take out the sword of the spirit. Whatever we're going through, we try to find a verse in the Bible, go to a concordance, ask a friend, uh, ask people to pray for it. Find a verse that fits what you're going through the same way that Jesus did. <clears throat> Write it on a card, put it in your pocket. The best thing obviously is to do what Jesus did. He took out his concordance and he looked through it. And, Hang on a second here, Satan. Okay, uh, I think I got a good one. Matthew, what is that? Deuteronomy. Okay, and then he took out his Old Testament, Deuteronomy. No, he didn't really do it. It was just, it was just, it was just there. <laughs> it's really, um, it's something we've lost in, in, in Christianity. I, I was just reading some uh, about a, a couple of, you know, well-known people of, of the faith. I think that uh, it was Martin Luther that had the entire Bible memorized in Latin. I, th- I think it was... Uh, uh, Wesley that, that had the whole New Testament memorized, not just in English, that'd be enough, in Greek. Uh, you know, we've, we've kind of lost this, this idea of, uh, of memorization and so forth. And uh, it's not just something Sunday school kids do to get a smiley face next to their name on, on a board. It's how we engage the enemy. It's how we defend ourselves. And sometimes the enemy comes to attack and he's got a pretty big sword. And we go, yeah. And we go, and it's like, it's a Boy Scout knife about that, that, that big. There's, just, there's not a lot we got to draw from. Uh, and when there's not, just go to your concordance and go to your Bible, find that verse, write it on a card, stick it on the mirror, put it in your pocket, put it on the dash of the card. Don't try to read it while you're driving though. It's for the stoplights. But uh, 
begin to, again, David said, I've hid thy word in my heart. He's talking about his mind so that I would not sin against you. And I just want to encourage you with a, a couple of things. And one is that you all memorize things all the time anyway. Now, how many of you, how many of you took out a map to get here this morning? No. Oh, did you memorize how to get here? That's amazing. All the way here. How about going home? Will you use a map? For, how about going to work tomorrow? Will they retrain you at work tomorrow because you've already forgotten what you're supposed to be doing there? No, you've actually memorized what you, what you do. We all memorize stuff all, all of the time. But somehow as Christians, and, and maybe if, because we weren't good at it in school or whatever, we have a tendency to think, I can't memorize. No, you do. <laughs> you do all the time. And so, so the key is to take God's word. And again, if you're, especially if you're going through a difficult time and you find a verse that's meaningful to you, it'll be a lot more easy to memorize because you need to. Because <laughs> that's what you're, you're clinging on to. That's what you're holding on to. It will become much more significant. And the more important it is to you, it's amazing how much easier it is to memorize. How do you do that? Repeating it over and over and over again. That's how you do it. There's no, there's no quick thing. You just, you, know, you just say that verse over and over again. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My gra-. That's how you do it. That's secret. You just say it over and over again. A little phrase. Five times. Get the other phrase. Five times. Hey, now you shoot for both of those phrases. Five times. Then leave it alone. If you just in your devotions pick out a, a f- five minutes a day, it's amazing the difference it can it can be in uh, in, in your life. I think it was uh, Billy Graham that said uh, towards the end of his ministry, somebody asked him if you could do it all over again, what would you do more of in terms of ministry? He said, "I would memorize more scripture." Uh, though that was pretty good from a guy that has preached to millions and God's tremendously tremendously used. So uh, very important. My, uh, my point, I guess, is this, is that if you make it a regular part of your life, then when the day of evil comes, you're good to go. Uh, if you don't, then you're, you're scrambling, and that's okay too. Write it on a card, carry it in your pocket, but find a specific verse so that you can engage the enemy and deal with the fears and the discouragement and, and the things, that the, the arrows that he wants to shoot uh, into your life that really in it, that prevent you from from walking victoriously with with Jesus Christ. Uh, again, the sword certainly would be used offensively. We can uh, uh, we need we need to know a certain amount of scripture so that we can share the gospel. Uh, there's a lot of other times that we just meet people along the way who are very discouraged, going through tough times. It's a wonderful thing to be able to share God's word with them, encourage them. And I found that a lot of people that are really struggling that at other times don't want to hear what you have to say. There are times when they do, especially if you have that, again, that rhema word of God, that specific God, word of God for their specific situation that can minister to their hearts. And very often then they'll want to hear more later uh, as a result. So uh, again, it's offensive as well as uh, defensive. But there is that re- rejection we face as well. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 2. By the way, the Roman Empire wasn't a real easy culture to share the gospel in uh, either, uh, by the way, but they still did a pretty good job. He says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in a triumphant procession in Christ. And uh, a triumphant procession was when, when a, a, a general in the, in the military went out and had a tremendous victory somewhere in the, in the Roman world. And then they, they got a parade when they came back to Rome. And they would be there in their chariots, you know, Cecil B. DeMille was there filming the whole thing, and they would march through the streets of Rome. And then they would have with them all the bounty that they had brought back from whatever land they had just, uh, you know, conquered and so forth. A triumphant procession. That's the picture uh, that Paul is using here. He's, but for us, it's God who always leads us in a triumphant procession in Christ, in victory. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. You ever share the gospel with somebody and he says, you stink? You say, would that be close to the smell of death? Oh, this is very biblical then. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a reaction that we're going to get, Paul says. 
But to other people that hear it and receive it, it's, it's the aroma of life. And, uh, and again, sometimes it's that sword of the Spirit that enables us to finally reach somebody, you know, that, that maybe can believe the Word of God a little bit that eventually might receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I think primarily meant here to be uh, a defensive, to, to prevent the enemy from attacking us, but uh, certainly can be used offensively as well. We need the proper armor, the proper weapons, and, uh, and uh, we don't fight as the world fights. We don't fight hatred with hatred. We don't fight pride with pride. We don't fight spite with spite. Our weapons are different. Our thinking is, uh, is different than it is in, in the world. They're not carnal weapons. They're, they're divine. And the things that Paul has talked about up to this point and will now lead into the importance of being on our knees and in prayer. Again, so important in, in the battle. Let me go back to uh, my opening illustration of, of David before he defeats uh, Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And I'll close with this. Uh, David said to the Philistines, as he goes out to face Goliath, you come against me with the sword and the spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. Is that trash talking or what? Verse 47, all those gathered here... here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And that's the, the foundation to kind of go with. Here's these tools that Paul's trying to give us, but uh, we need to remember we're going to stand firm and that the, the battle is, is the Lord's. We stand in his strength and uh, uh, in his power. You know when we have the worship song and there's a little dove on there? Yep. Call it the Maranatha dove. Sometimes you go to a lot of Calvary chapels, and they've uh, they've got the uh, the dove up. A lot of people don't even know what the dove's for <laughs> anymore. We're a couple generations removed. It's to remind us of a passage in Zechariah that says, "It is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord." Uh, we need to, to to trust in the Lord. That's how we're going to have uh, victory in the, in these areas. And then when we have it, He gets the glory. It's not. It's not our doing. All we're doing is, is relating to him and, and trusting him and trusting his word. Sure is gold is precious and the honey sweet. So you love this city and you love it see. Every child out playing by their own front door. Every baby laying on the bedroom. Stop holding on. This love, this love, your hope and love.